Sunday, exciting day. It is such a tremendous, exciting day. It's a day where God had plans. And God decided that these plans are now is the countdown. And to me, when I think of uh, Palm Sunday, I think of the countdown time that begins where the action plan is put in place and Satan's time is limited. And to me, seeing the limitation being placed on Satan, his mandate to destroy the children of God and destroy the ones that are going to be birthed into this world and to destroy his assignments, to me, it just speaks of the beauty of the Lord that he had us in mind and he wanted to see us secure, loved, complete and lacking nothing. And so think of that. So as we look at this word, we can just see that God has got order and very strange ways of doing things. He could have called down fire from heaven and destroyed all the works of the devil in one shot. But we wouldn't have believed it was God. We would have still been reasoning and thinking, oh, could it be? No, it was a fireball. No, it was, it was the world that is warming up. And yes, it must be what is happening uh, right now. Because we do the funny reasoning. Because we listen sometimes more to Santas than we listen to the real deal. And so we can hear that there's a lot going down at this very hour. And it has not stopped working on behalf of us. So what is Palm Sunday really, is I want to look at that. What does it really mean? There is an answer. Palm Sunday is the day we celebrate. Did you hear the word celebrate? And what do we celebrate? The triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. The announcement was made. They recognize this is a powerful, he's a king. He must be made the king of an overthrow, the Roman government. They saw a solution. And one week before his resurrection, so God is a fast mover. Think about it. He puts a plan in place on that Sunday. And the very next Sunday, he lets prophecy come and be fulfilled. Where Jesus is risen three days on the third day from death into life. Now think how fast moving that was. Imagine you driving down to Cape Town. It is quite a few, many hours on the road. If you stay on the road and you don't stay overnight, 14 hours, 13, 14, depending where you're going. And you are traveling relentlessly um, uh, through that long journey. But can you imagine being three days in the pits of hell? And taking back the one key off to the other key that belongs to the children of God. And overthrowing the government in the pits of hell of the devil. His evil plans overthrowing all of that and bringing, birthing new life for us. Sonship, daughtership, identity. Because Satan tried to destroy that. I love that about God. So... On this Palm Sunday, as Jesus entered the holy city, so there was a place, an appointed place, like it is with us. We have an appointed assignment. We have an appointed ground use that God has got for us. Every one of us have been appointed and given the responsibility from above to do with his anointing what needs to be done. Now think about it. We don't think about that. We just think we can cruise through as children of God and enjoy his benefits. And we must never have any trouble. Look at Paul. He didn't think that. He counted a blessing to go through trouble because he knew that he was absolutely setting the record straight. And that the devil couldn't take away Satan and the demonic forces that were working through that government that put him in the sewage parlor underneath where all the stink was going through. And he spent many years there writing 
the best parts of the word of God in the midst of all of that suffering. But he understood his mandate. That the circumstances and the environment could not remove the mandate God had given him. Entrusted. But can I tell you why he was that disciplined? Because when he worked, he understood what it was like to be under authority. And if we don't get that, we'll never be under authority. He knew what it was like to be under authority. He didn't ever rise up against the government that commissioned him to go and kill. He understood the mission and he followed through with what was required. And then when he was, the journey was interrupted in his Damascus um, encounter, immediately when he was struck blind, he understood and he could even hear the Lord speak to him. And he answered him, Lord. So there was no confusion in his life. He knew what he was dealing with. And he stayed on mission. He stayed red hot and on fire. He didn't allow anything to remove his faithfulness. So we're hearing loud and clear today. So when Jesus entered the holy city, he, ne he neared the culmination. That's the beginning and the end, the finality of a long journey towards Golgotha. And so when we look at the definition, define culmination, very important to look at words, the end or the final result of something. So imagine someone saying to you, so what is your culmination about this? With other words, what is your final result of this? How do you see it? Do we even know? Because a lot of people say, I don't know. I don't know. It's like standing in faith for a loved one to come back to the Lord as God had designed. How do you see them? Do you see them in the in-between or do you see the final result? Do you see them preaching out there? Do you see them with a mandate? Because if you cannot see it, you can't have that. So you have to see it. And it has to be more than any shame the devil is trying to put on you to slow you down by. It's got to be so mandate in your life. Amen to that. And so he had come to save. What was the final result? He had come to save the lost. That was the mandate. And now was the time. This was the place to secure the salvation. I love that about God, that he knows his plans and his thoughts and the future he's called us all into. There's no hesitation. So God knows how to put a, place, a plan in place next to you. He knows if you need someone to speak for you, or if you know, need someone to type for you, or he knows because you're busy and caught up with many other things, he knows what to put in place. If he needs a communicator, he put a communicator there. Because you give the instruction, it takes a lot of time to do all these things, and then you can't do the most important part. So he knows how to place to get the job done, the dream team together. And so the time, the place, and he was securing salvation. Thank God for that. I'm so glad that he had salvation for me. That he had an appointed time for me. That the real deal will become urgent enough to me. Not the appearance, not the short term, but the long term plan. So Luke 19 verse 10 says in the New Living Translation, For the Son of Man, Jesus came to seek and save those who are lost. He seek them and he saved them. And he brought them out of being lost, confused, into a place to have a sound mind. Now think about that. Have I received the sound mind? Have I received the thought pattern to ponder on 
that glorifies my Father. Something to think about. Because you cannot receive the gospel without receiving what it produces. And if we're not receiving the production, and we're not facilitators of a sound mind, then are we saved? Because he said he'll put his spirit in you. No longer I, but the Christ lives through me. So if we're not going to get rid of the old, and we tolerate Satan, then we're going to miss the mark of entering in, good and faithful servant of the Most High. Because if our strongholds are entertained, and our emotions are holy cows to us, then are we saved or are we still lost? That's a question to ask. Because if I'm lost, I'm not in a good place. If my mind is not disciplined, then I don't know the word. And it's only the truth of the written word of God that makes me different, more like my father. The things I used to do, I no longer want to be part of. But if you still ensnared and still doing the things that is causing harm to your body, are you then faithful with a body he's entrusted in your care? Something to think about. Because when you don't have those lungs anymore, how are you going to feel? Are you still going to serve the Lord? When you don't have those feet and you don't have those arms and you don't have those eyes, and you don't have those ears, will you still serve the Lord? Or are you going to be lost? No longer he, but the Christ in me, that now, the appointed time, the timing, now lives by choice. So I think we need to really look at the word and start evaluating, where am I? What am I called to do? What is God's plan? Because the more we go after money, the less we will be satisfied. Because he, so he says he abundantly supplies us daily everything that you need. So are we complete then? Yes, lacking nothing. You've got bread in the house. You've got water. Abundantly, whatever you need. Is there. So, this particular season, Palm Sunday, marked the start of what we often call Passion Week. And I often wonder why do they call it the Passion Week? Because how does it put passion back in our hearts if we don't even understand what was done for us? What was his journey like? Why did he sign in? And why did he want to see us no longer lost, but found in him? So why don't we let go of the self and we take the identity he's given us? And this was the final seven days on the face of the earth that he wanted us to know. And so Palm Sunday was truly the beginning of the end of the old. Think about it. The beginning of the old. And that made me think. I thought, have I put the old under my feet yet? Or does the old still rule in my life? Because if the old is not under our feet... It is interrupting the flow of God's goodness on the face of the earth. And what did he mean? He meant free from the curse of spiritual death. And if we are blind, that's spiritual death. If we can't see or hear, then we're still not alive in him. And so this must have been such a loud announcement that very day when he came down. It caught 
all of their attention because all of them immediately recognized on him that he was the one. He was the answer to what they'd been looking for. They stripped their clothing. They didn't run naked, but they stripped the layers of their clothing and started throwing it on the ground for the donkey and him, to, uh, the ass, to come running on that pathway because they recognized he had what they needed. I think that must have been such an amazing thing. In the book of Matthew, it says, verse 20, chapter 21, verse 1, it says, as Jesus and the disciples approached, they weren't even there yet, and there was an announcement in Jerusalem. They came to the town of Bethlehem and the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. And you know, this is very important to be purpose-driven. Sometimes you'll be sent ahead to go and fulfill the plan of God. You get saved first and then your family comes in. So we must remember that God's always got purpose. So he was, they were sent ahead. And in verse 2, go into the village instruction over there. And he said, as soon as you enter it, think about the map, so direct and so sure. You will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. Did you hear the word them? We only think of one donkey. But do you know that them, there was two? Donkey and the colt was brought. And they did that. In verse 3, if anyone asks what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs them. Very direct. No negotiation to pay for it. It was a God-ordained plan. Amen? And he went immediately. Let, he says, and he will immediately let you take them. So talk about a way maker. Our God is a way maker. Evidence of it again. In verse 4, this took place, it was fulfilled. The purpose was fulfilled that he prophesied. Tell the people of Israel, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So he was coming. Talk about it. everything you face in life is already ordained by the Lord before you even get there or do it. He knows the beginning and the end. So verse 6, the two disciples did as Jesus commanded. And what do we see in them? And these are the pointers that really stand out today for me. Is number one, obedience. And number two, sacrifice. And number th three, follow through. And that's what leadership and following the Lord is all about. Obedience, sacrifice, and follow through. Matthew 21 verse 7 says, They brought the donkey and the colt to him. They threw their garments over the colt and he sat on it. They wouldn't even let him sit on the donkey without protection. So servanthood, you're hearing servanthood the whole time, mindful of what is his need right now. And verse 8, most of the crowd spread their garments on the road. Monkey see, monkey do. No, there was an order. There was an anointing. There was a presence of God and confirmation. And so they did that ahead of him, and others cut branches. Remember the palm leaves, branches, trees, and spread them on the road. So they rode on all of this provision and this welcoming um, anointing that was set out, recognized by the people. And so we see there in verse 9, Jesus was in the center of the procession. It's a procession, and it's not like when they toy-toy 
with all our governing people for water, housing, whatever, all the promises that were made. Did you note that they didn't destroy anything? They didn't go breaking windows. They didn't go breaking uh, this. They didn't go destroying the donkey or the colt. They absolutely welcomed the anointing that was present by the obedience. And so they were shouting, praise God for the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. Now think about that it was broadcasted and we have truly been set free from the curse of spiritual death. That's the first thing that God took care of. He wanted us to be able to see what is important to him and not to be spiritually dead and under the curse. So this is the beginning of the yoke-destroying anointing that was released upon the people. But the change of heart took place so quickly. The one minute they like this, and the next minute they spitting and shouting and throwing stones at him and, and, and hating him when they saw him walk down the Della Rosa with his cross on his back. So aren't we extremely fickle? As human people, we jump in from being in the spirit to being totally the other side in the flesh under the influences of the devil. Right? So we must not take any credit for our salvation. Our good works can't save us. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, God saved you by his grace. When you believe. So believing is a requirement. When you believe, you receive the saving grace. And you can't take credit for it. It is a gift from God. So when we receive the saving grace, the grace of God, we get saved. That's our first gift we receive from our Father. And you know what we could really say? What are we doing with a gift that we receive? Have we become pew sitters or are we working our faith? What are we doing with the first gift that we receive? Are we doing something with it? Or are we going to become like those guys that bury their talents? So working your gifts and working the free gift that you receive from the Lord is so important. Then we'll never find ourselves passive and no testimony at all. Verse 9 says, salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. Absolutely not. So none of us can boast about it. But Jesus, his sacrifice, we can become children of God when we believe the word and we receive it. And that's what salvation is. Believe it. And receive it. Don't leave your salvation out there and make it of no, none effect in your life. Your salvation and our salvation came at such a high price. Jesus paid intensely for it. Father God had to close his eyes and look away from what they had done to his son. Pierce him. Beat him, belittle him, spit on him. None of us have ever endured that kind of punishment. It came at a high price. So to compromise and go back to the old lifestyle, I would literally say that's abominable. It's throwing everything he did for me, throwing it away. And making it of no effect. And it came at such a high price. And an illustration of what happened when we die can truly be found in Luke 16. And I often speak about it. Chapter 16 verse 19 to 31. Where our lives could be likened to this. 
And he speaks of it so beautifully. He says in verse 19, Jesus said, there was a certain rich man. He'd achieved everything, had everything his heart desired who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury. So even he could speak about it. And at verse 20, and at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. And so look at the country lifestyle. One hasn't got a home, but he's lying outside the rich man's gate. And the rich man had so much, plenty. And there's two different country lives, lives that are so different. But the Lord was watchful. And verse 21 says, as Lazarus lay there, longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dog came and the dogs would come and lick his open sores that were all over his body. He had sores oozing and he must have been in pain. You know what? Those nerve ends were all open. Now, have you ever had a nerve end that is open or volatile? You'll know that is, it, it is an excruciating pain and nothing seems to dim it down or take it away. It always lulls. You know it's there. And obviously, in modern medicine, there's certain meds that they use, but prayer is the best you could ever get. So I can just imagine how the level of pain that he must have had with all those sores, volatile, all those nerve ends were open. The wind and everything must have been so excruciating, painful. And yet God is witnessing the two contrary lives like that. So he sends the dogs to just lick over it, medicate it, to try and dim the pain. And in verse 22, finally the poor man died. He'd come to the end of his pain, the end of his suffering. And he was carried by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. Remember, he wasn't carried away by angels. So what a different leaving of the earth. One was buried, one was carried to father of many nations. The one that had the covenant, place that was prepared for us. Jesus Christ already prepared a place for us. And remember, his soul went to the place of the dead. There in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus, which he recognized, that man that used to sit at his gate on his side. But yet he's not there. And yet he believed he had a high position of honor. But yet now what he had on earth is no longer invested in his future. So in verse 24, the rich man shouted, Father Abraham, talk about us recognizing each other when we get to heaven. And even the hard of hearing will recognize Father Abraham. They will also recognize Jesus and they'll recognize God and they'll see the devil as well, the one they invested in. So the rich man shouted, he said, Father Abraham, have some pity. It's a bit too late to ask for that. Send Lazarus over here and dip the tip, he wants him to serve him, of his finger in the pool and cool my tongue. So you can really see the heat is turned up when you get there. It's not a heat that we've been complaining about. You're on the face of the earth. Many of us are sitting with fans, trying to just cool down. Some of us are using water. We're doing all sorts, spray, whatever. 
that there he's even asking for water just on his fingertip to just cool his tongue. So he's on fire. And he says, I am in anguish in these flames. So we can hear that that kind of torment that he was in is an anguishing, tormenting suffering. It's not a good place that we want to invest in. And so in verse 25, we see, But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted, and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted, and you are in anguish. And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cover over to you from here, and no one can cross over to us from there. Family, don't think that people visit you when they died. Because he has guarantee. No one can leave and no one can come and see you and tell you about anything in heaven. Because there's your proof. No one can cross over and come to you. It could just be a familiar spirit. Or an angel. I would be inclined to say. Ministering angels. So in verse 27, then the rich man said, please, pleading, Father Abram, at least send him to my father's house. Now he wants them to be warned. And for I have five brothers, and I want him to be warned, warn them, so that they don't end up in the place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets, hear that, have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. And so all of us had opportunity where we have been warned by the written word of God. And someone has spoken within our hearing the truths that God wanted you to hear. And verse 30, the rich man replied, No, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent and their sins from their sins and turn to God. With other words, he had no time and he made no time to turn to God while he was on the face of the earth. But yet Lazarus had t- turned to God. His whole everything had turned to the Lord. But Abraham said, it's amazing he still answers him. Because he was stubborn when he was on the face of the earth. But now he wants to inquire and have conversation. He says, what would you have done? You probably would have said, no, enough with talking. I've had, you were warned, goodbye, I'm going to the place that's prepared for me because your job is done. Amen. He says, but if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't listen even. If someone rises from the dead, they won't listen. So do you see that we can be hard of hearing as well? God will send us messages. He uses all things. But we, if we don't watch that, we won't hear the voice of God warning us about things that are important in our lives. And so let's have a look when a person dies. When a person dies, he or her spirit and soul go to the eternal home, heaven or hell. Whatever they've been building their lives on, knowing the truth, practicing the truth, you know you're going to heaven. Rejecting the truth, you know where you're going, to the place you've invested in the flesh. So Jesus explained what happened to the particular rich man and a beggar when they both died. And if we think about it, the beggar, Lazarus, was taken by angels to Abraham's bosom. I'd rather be taken with angels than their demons carry me to the hot pot. Amen. And it's not a small pot. It is a big 
area, and it was never designed for a human being. It was designed by rebellious people, for rebellious people, demonic forces. Amen? So the rich man went to hell. He had no future because he didn't see it was important to invest himself in something that was truthful. And yet the rich man could still feel things. And that's something to remember. He could feel things. The same when Jesus went to the pits of hell to go and receive our keys. He could feel and experience all this torment. And he paid for it. And when it was complete, he took the keys of freedom back for us. And he remembered the rich man. There was nothing wrong with his memory. He could remember his life on the face of the earth. Could remember everything. So after a physical death, we will have spiritual bodies. And our soul will still be intact. Remember that. Often people say, but which part of us is alive? Your soul will still be alive and the spirit of man. Amen? And we receive a new body when we get to heaven. So when we die here on the face of the earth, we will have a spiritual body. And we, when we leave the earth, immediately the transfer is shift and swift. There is no delay whatsoever. I love that about the Lord. And we can see and read today in Romans 8, verse 13 and 16. For if you live according to the sinful nature, the choices we make that God can't be found in, you will die. But if by the Spirit you will put to death the misdeeds of the body and you will live. And because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. Isn't that beautiful? And by him we cry, Abba, Father, because we sons and daughters of the Most High. And the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And we're confident about it. You'll hear Pastor Dean say, are you confident? The, the frontline introduction. What is your frontline introduction? Exactly, confident. And that confidence is so important because you've got to know who do I belong to. Where have I invested my life? Am I a child of God or am I barely getting there? Because if I haven't said goodbye to the old and I'm still living the old, then I'm not renewed on a daily basis. And so there is a coming day, truly, that we are going to experience what God is talking about. And he's saying to us today, he says that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And that is in Philippians 2 verse 10 and verse 11. So important that the worship on a daily basis that we bring to the Father will confirm who are we? What have we plugged into? Are we children of God? Are we confident in our salvation? Or are we living for ourselves and the lust of our flesh? And I believe something today, that when Jesus went down that journey on his way to be persecuted, but first, the first thing was, is remember that he overthrew the things, the dens and the thieves in the temple, right? And then remember that he went from there. And this week we'll talk a little bit more of that. Then he went and he had his supper. And there was all sorts of hoo-ha about Mary Magdalene that brought, that prepared him for his burial by bringing her perfume. And he sat there and all the disciples were moaning and complaining. They were with Jesus, 
but they had not remembered a word he had spoken to them. Can you imagine how dangerous that must be? That they couldn't remember that he was telling them about the time that was coming. That Peter even got out of line. And when they, uh, the soldiers arrived and they wanted Jesus and he offered himself, Peter got so angry, took his sword and he chopped the, uh, the uh, soldier's ear off. And even at that time, Jesus stepped in and he says, have you no understanding of what is really happening here? And he took the ear and miraculously put it back on the soldier's head. And everything was mended, complete, lacking nothing. And we learn out of this journey, they'd been with the anointed one for three years. They had seen miracles that you and I have not even seen yet. They had seen people raised from the dead. They had seen blind eyes open right before their eyes. Death ears open. Demons sent packing. People delivered. And yet right in that final hour, the warning they had, the information they had, they were still caught up in the natural. Sat around the table. He told them the stories. Even there, he had to rebuke Peter and say, get behind me, Satan. Because he recognized the demonic force was the influence that he was under. I don't want to live there. I want to live in the heart of God for the rest of my life, don't you? I want to riv- live ready. If anything interrupts your walk on the face of the earth, that you know where you've invested yourself into. And that is what God is looking for. Are you confident with your salvation? Do you know where you're going to spend the rest of your life? Is it going to be in eternity, in heaven? Or is it in that place, the hot pot? And it's not a small pot. It's a big area. There are prisons. There's torment, demonic forces. Fear that you have never known in your life is the fear you will find. And you can't shout then. No, no, I belong to the watchtowers. No, no, you can't take me. I belong to the apostolic church. No, no, you can't take me. I belong to the Anglican. I'm a Methodist. You can't shout those names out there. Because it's got everything to do with where have you invested your heart? Who has the keys to your heart? And I believe that's what we've got to give time to today. It's been the message literally from beginning to end. But it is the time we're living in. So would you bow your heads right now? And with God as your witness right now, standing beside you, right here in the atmosphere, giving us opportunity to redirect our lives. Redirect, where do you want to invest? What do you want in your future? Who do you want to serve? You could serve in the pits of hell, demonic forces, torment, fear, and no future. Or you can serve in a place that is prepared for you through Jesus Christ, the way maker, place of harmony, place of praise, place with the glory of God. And homes with many rooms prepared for all of us in advance. And this morning, this is not about religion. 
this is about a decision. This is about a commitment. Where have you placed? Who have you given the keys to your heart? Who owns your life? This morning, I believe God is saying, be very sure who owns your future? Who owns your life? And if it is built on gossip, offenses, hurt, pointing out judgment, who owns your heart and your life? And this morning, if you're in this place and you want to be sure and you recognize that there are areas that Satan has used and you want to take back the keys, the ownership, and give it to Jesus, then this morning would you stand and would you pray this prayer of commitment today? And repentance is always reinstatement. Repentance removes all of the gaps, all of the separation, and brings you back to a place of safety. So this morning, if you hear and you recognize that there are areas in your life that has not been given to God, Areas in your life that Satan holds the keys to, which is stand to your feet and say, I recognize. I recognize their places. I recognize there are issues in my life that Satan is Lord of. I recognize that there are things in my life that God is not author of. And if that is what you recognize today, then would you say, Lord, Forgive me. Forgive me for allowing these areas in my life to be influenced by the things of the world. And this morning, I want to make this right. And I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me this day as I choose this day, that I want to build the rest of my life on the right foundation, on the foundation of life, with a future that is spent in heaven, eternity, where Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of my life. And so this morning, I rebuke you, Satan, and I choose this day that I'm placing the temptations and those strongholds and those open doors right now under my feet. And I'm taking the full authority back to choose wisely. And I choose Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior of my life. I believe that his sacrifice on and through the cross was done because God so loved me that he was willing to offer up his only son to pay for my sins, pay for my shortfalls and my wrong decisions. And I today thank you, Father God, for making a way for me that I can be saved, forgiven, and delivered out of the old. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are the one that will help me to walk through the journey of life, making the choices that pleases my Father. That means... My old love, I lay it at the feet of Jesus. And I know that his blood cleanses me today. That I no longer live as the old, but I live as the new.
and I receive the new life through Jesus Christ forevermore in Jesus' name. I believe today that I am a child of God, that I am forgiven, and that I have a great future that I'm going to spend in eternity in heaven as a child of God. In Jesus' name. Say, Holy Spirit, thank you for teaching me. Thank you for healing me today. Thank you that I'm delivered today out of the old and placed on the sure foundation of my inheritance, walking with God, chosen by Him, paid for in full, and have a desire to do what is right for the rest of my life. I believe it, I receive it, and I have what I say in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen and amen.